Coming up on Nebraska Stories, one of the fastest track riders in the world. The legendary mechanic behind the winning 1958 Monza Roadster. The little known history of Nebraska's tuberculosis hospital. And carving a niche in crane country. Let's just say it, Ashton Lambie's a really interesting dude. There's the handlebar mustache, tattoos, tree trunk legs, a music performance major in college, analytical mind, laid back personality. Plus he can effortlessly rip down a country road at 25 miles an hour. I like, you know, the speed that everything goes by at. Um, I like getting to, you know, just see everything. And uh, I just find it like a pretty relaxing activity. It's nice, it's fun. This day, he isn't riding hard, just getting from his house to the gym at his parents' place for a workout. It's kind of a rest and recovery day. Four days earlier, he was in Bolivia, breaking a world record. Lambie broke his own track cycling world record, set a year earlier, in the individual pursuit, a race where riders start on opposite sides of a 250-meter banked track and try to catch each other for 4,000 meters. He's also part of the American record in the team pursuit. Being able to represent the country is huge. All this just three years after his first real track race, Oh, and throw in the fact that the nearest velodrome, an arena for track cycling, is more than 400 miles away. How does this happen? First, while kind of new to track racing, Lambie has spent a lot of hours on a bike starting in high school. Gravel races, ultra-distance races, his longest was 1,200 kilometers. That's about 750 miles in four days. He broke the record for riding across the state of Kansas covering 400 miles in less than 24 hours. One day, he came across a race on a grass track in Kansas. He was hooked. Yeah, it's pretty exhilarating. It's just fun to have like an effort on such a contained course and you don't have to worry about anything else, like any external factors. Um, you're just going as fast as you can in like a controlled environment, which is fun. One year later, he's on the US national team. Two years later, he's a world record holder. Yeah, like once you switch training and just start training for this one specific thing, it goes pretty quickly. And there were a lot of new things that it was easy to see huge performance gains. You know, like the first year I did the gym, like I got a lot stronger. Um, I hadn't really been doing any strength or gym training up until that point. So like that makes a huge difference. And then yeah, just doing all the track specific training, that kind of stuff. The lack of a velodrome for training is no big deal. There are occasional trips to the US Olympic Training Center in Colorado but mainly power meters on his gravel bikes and indoor trainers let him replicate the power he needs to generate on the track. Coffee, chocolate, and something inside lets him handle the hardest workouts his trainer can throw at him. I don't feel like I've tapped out or like I've hit my ceiling on training, so I think I can keep progressing with that. You're on a, a track that's fairly consistent and you're just riding 16 laps but there's so many subtleties and like really small details that you can just refine and keep working on. Lambie's first track race of any kind happened a decade earlier. I actually didn't even remember that I raced here until you brought it up that we were gonna film here yeah. at the tractor test track. And I was like, I've ridden there before, absolutely. Yep, ridden on the oval the University of Nebraska Lincoln uses to test tractors. Quick trivia, this is the only lab like this for tractor testing in the Western Hemisphere. But back to cycling. 
18-year-old Lambie was riding for an Omaha team in a UNL cycling club event, staged counterclockwise, backwards, for some reason. I crashed, actually. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I tangled handlebars with the guy for a sprint. I was okay. The other guy did not finish the race. Uh, I got a new wheel and then hopped back in the race and finished. <laughs> We brought him back a decade later. It's different than what he races on now, longer and without banks on the turns, but still a good place to show me a few things about track riding. I don't think I'm gonna win. That easy for you? Oh, I was, I was working a little bit. <laughs> so you can do that for two and a half miles at 36 miles an hour. Is that how long 4K is? Oh my God, <laughs> that sounds way longer. You don't take the best line. <laughs> you can make the turns easier on yourself, right? Uh huh. Like, start on the outside. If you try to hit the inner line at the middle, ah. so you peak right here, and then we start drifting back out, right? And then you just ovalize the track, right? So let's talk about the, uh, the team pursuit. And I'm not gonna get as close as normal, but how close would you be? Eight to 12 inches. Do you feel how much easier it is? I can, I can tell a ton, because if yeah. I do this, yeah, I can tell a difference in the effort. And it's like, it's at least a 25% difference. The other hard thing is that none of us have brakes. So like if you get too close to the guy huh. in front of you, you can't like, you can't hit the brake, which sounds terrifying. But then yeah. if nobody has brakes, it'd be like if you're all riding, driving on the interstate and everybody just had cruise control, like. Right. It just makes everybody really smooth. So did you ever think you'd be at this point two years ago, three years ago? No, absolutely not. 100%. But how cool is it? It's super fun. I mean, like being out here, you know, 10 years later in the USA kit, yeah. going the right direction, <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. And knowing that this is the right direction, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's super fun. Thanks for doing this. Dude, thank you, that was fun. It was great. Track cycling is an off the radar thing in the United States. The best of the best in lots of sports make millions and live lavish lifestyles America's fastest track cyclist tinkers with bikes in a rural Lancaster County garage while stepping around recently harvested garlic from his garden. I like it. I like where I'm at. It's a good gig. After the record in Bolivia, you know, it was like a bunch of people were like, oh, can I have your picture? Can I have your, like, will you sign this? And I'm, I was like, God, I can't wait to go back to Nebraska and like go to Costco and like no one, you know, maybe one person recognizes me. There's one big showcase for sports like this every four years, the Olympics. But you won't see Ashton Lambie in Tokyo. The number of countries that qualify for the four-man pursuit was cut to eight before the 2020 games, and the U.S. didn't make it. Plus, the International Olympic Committee dropped individual pursuit from competition after the 2008 Olympics. It's a tough break, a harsh reality. But no complaints, Lambie's happy doing what he's doing relishing still wearing that USA jersey on the track and with sponsors, lots of other rides and events coming up. I love it. It's a blast. It feels awesome. Like going that fast on the bike and just like everything that you keep working on is clicking. Um, yeah, that's probably the best feeling. No brakes on this bike, that doesn't matter. This dude doesn't want anything to slow him down. So Ashton Lambie, ladies and gentlemen, he is your gold medalist here at the Velo Sports Center. More than 60 years after he got his professional start in Nebraska, legendary race car builder and innovator Bob McKee is back where it all began. It's a walk down memory lane at the Speedway Motors Museum in Lincoln. He always had a, a bigger car tire on the right front and a bigger hub and bearings. 
McKee has been interested in mechanical things for as long as he can remember. Growing up, he liked to tinker. His race car building career started with an ad in the Sears and Roebuck catalog. They had a Craftsman welding kit and I bought that. I was, I probably when I was 15 or 16 and started welding and uh, melting stuff and burning myself and pretty soon you're sticking metal together and it worked. He was soon building hot rods in high school and later met legendary race car driver Tiny Lund, a giant of a man who drove stock cars across the Midwest, including in Nebraska. McKee outfitted a stock 1956 Pontiac with racing modifications for Lund. The pair hit the road to race in small towns, Lund the driver and McKee the mechanic. I had my 21st birthday out here and he took me to, to Omaha for a steak dinner and uh, he was going to show me a big time, time in Omaha. And the first place we walked into, they asked him for his ID and they didn't ask me for mine because I, I was just 21 but he was six years older and it really ticked him off. Lund soon left to race with NASCAR and went on to win the Daytona 500 in 1963. Meanwhile, Bob McKee enrolled at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln as a mechanical engineering student. He lasted a semester. Mechanical drawing was really useful for the rest of my life and the English classes and stuff, not so much, but uh, you know, everybody has things that they're better at and worse at. Um, I, I could take things apart and put them together, and, and I enjoyed that. When it became clear his future was in race car building and not the classroom, McKee never looked back. He'd work at Speedway Motors' original shop in downtown Lincoln on the weekends, helping legendary owner Bill Smith. In 1958, he was part of the winning crew at the grueling 500-mile Monza race in Monza, Italy. It was a turning point. The original winning roadster is displayed at the Speedway Motors Museum. I'm there on the right up there. I was in the Army at the time, and um, I was a little thinner then and had more hair. But, uh, you know, that was quite an exciting thing, being in Italy and Monza and racing with some of the best drivers in the world. The slick-looking A.J. Watson Roadster stood out among the more well-established Italian supercars. Our cars, I always thought, were superior craftsmanship in the construction of them. Uh, the Ferraris, Formula One cars, there were several of them there, but they kind of look like a sack of walnuts. They're all lumpy and bumpy, and, but this is all smooth and slick and well-constructed. Soon, McKee launched out on his own, opened his own shop in Illinois, and spent the next 50 years as one of racing's ultimate insiders. Even if racing fans didn't know him, everyone on pit road did. He built Indy cars, Can-Am cars, stock cars, sports cars, and even what was considered the first practical electric car in the early 1970s. Exide Willard and Railvac came and said, would you be interested in building an electric car? And I said, sure, we're interested in building anything. So it was a, a challenge and interesting. And um, so that was another fork in the road that took us off over here. And we built a lot, probably 35 different electric cars, you know, since those first ones. McKee also helped build a turbine car, basically a jet powered race car that competed with more established manufacturers. He rubbed shoulders with celebrities like actor Paul Newman, who used one of McKee's cars in a movie, and Mercury astronauts Gus Grissom and Gordon Cooper, who owned a race car McKee built. That's when they were on the cover of Life magazine and um, flying the fastest jets and doing the wildest kind of crazy things in, in spacecraft, so that was a, a fun time. He was known for being able to build just about anything, including the innovative McKee transaxle that would work with high-powered race cars. For mechanical people trying to figure out how to make a car run faster and better and be stronger and aerodynamic and all the things involved, it, it uh, is so challenging that it kind of absorbs your life. After more than 60 years as a race innovator and engineering icon, he reflects on a career that got started in Nebraska. 
I consider myself very, very fortunate to be able to be involved with interesting cars and interesting people and uh, do challenging engineering projects and meet a lot of fun people and do interesting things. I couldn't have had a better, better career doing anything else. I was very happy doing that. This is one of the biggest areas of concern where we have plaster, original plaster, that's cracked because of temperature variations, humidity. My name is Will Stoudemire. I'm the director here at the Frank Museum. This museum is a historic home that was also once part of the Nebraska State Hospital for tuberculosis. Uh, it served as the hospital in the earliest years of that institution and over time uh, served as the chief residence for the superintendent and doctors and other staff at the hospital. Because of how family physicians came back to us. So when I first began working at the Frank Museum, the home had been mostly restored on the first floor to its earliest appearance when it was a private residence in the 1890s. The upper levels of the home had seen very little work over many decades, and in fact the third floor, which had served as a residence for much of the staff at the tuberculosis hospital, had been almost completely untouched. What we decided to do was something a little bit different for a historic house museum, and to actually restore uh, the upper floors of the home to the way the house appeared when it was part of this very important state institution, to use what had been left behind as a guide for that restoration work, and then in those spaces to interpret the history of that hospital. This hospital and its story is very important, not just the history of Kearney, but really to the history of the entire state of Nebraska and the larger Great Plains region. This was an institution that, over the course of its existence, over 60 years, treated thousands upon thousands of Nebraskans, Kansansans, people from the larger region, uh, for this disease, for this very scary disease of tuberculosis. Treating and containing tuberculosis is a great concern for the state of Nebraska. The uncontrolled spread of the disease among farmers, railroaders, and factory workers threatens the state economy. For this reason, state funding helps many pay for treatment, covering anywhere from half to the entirety of their health care costs. Some of these lower-income patients are African Americans, primarily from Lincoln and Omaha. At a time when people of color faced discrimination in housing, education, and access to facilities at home, at the state hospital, they receive integrated housing and care. This extends to Hispanic and Native American patients as well. It's important to keep in mind that with a place like this, in this part of the country, in the rural Midwest, integration is more the result of a lack of racial diversity, not the absence of racial prejudice. And so what we see early on in the history of the hospital is in fact bubbling controversies in the community as it becomes public knowledge that African American patients and white patients are receiving the same form of treatment and are actually sleeping in the same rooms. And it's one of the very first nurses who has to come out publicly and defend the practice of treating patients equally regardless of their race. And this is, of course, quite progressive uh, for the early 1900s. Thousands of children in Nebraska have their childhoods interrupted by tuberculosis, the disease spreading in classrooms and on playgrounds. For infected children from lower and working class families with little financial means, Admission to Kearney's tuberculosis hospital was often the only solution. As many as one in four patients at the hospital are under the age of 18. Some are younger than five. The hospital staff works hard to balance treatment, which includes hours of bed rest with the needs of active, growing youth. Schoolwork is accompanied by picnics along the Kearney Canal, concerts on holidays, and the occasional play or pageant. For brief moments each day, these sick youths are allowed a childhood as they wish for health and a cure for their disease. 
Hey, this is Will over at the Frank Museum. Is Lucas in the office? Well, you know, when you give me something good like that, I'm going to get excited. Um, we, whatever he's got, I'd love to see it, and we'd probably be willing to take it. Um, it's just you, you picked a funny day because we're having the uh, tuberculosis hospital exhibit installed like, right now. I'm thrilled that you're opening up the rest of the house. It's wonderful that people are going to be able to know some of that history because a lot of people have no idea what that disease was like. My dad would just, you know, probably shake his head and wouldn't want any of the attention or anything like that. I think he would be happy maybe to uh, say, you know, there was some good people here that treated a lot of people that really needed it and, and maybe they should be remembered or the good nurses and, and doctors that were involved. TB is coming back. It's coming antibiotic resistant now. And we could see a, a upsurge in TB again. So who knows? What we hope this exhibit will do is help to dispel some of the myths associated with the State Tuberculosis Hospital and also provide a place for people to connect with this important part of our community's past and of our state's history. It's important for us to understand the kind of radical approach that was taken here as well, that this was an institution designed to treat the poor, that this was an institution that the state of Nebraska subsidized. Uh, in order to ensure that the poor in our state could receive treatment for this disease. This was a radical approach in the early 1900s and it's important for us to think about what that might mean for us today. Sandhill cranes paint the sky and cover the water along the Platte River in central Nebraska every spring. Oh yeah, we saw a lot of cranes through the years. <laughs> Soaring up in the air, and beautiful. Gene Gustafson has been a part of that scene his entire life. This 95-year-old longtime farmer has always lived near the river and has even served as a guide for crane watchers. I don't know, it's just God's creation in the morning and, you know, and the sunrise just can't be beat, you know. It's just, it is just so beautiful, especially over my, in my opinion over the Platte River. The cranes have served as inspiration for many artists. Gene is one of them. His canvas is a block of wood. From that, he carves out the cranes he remembers from those many mornings on the river. I guess I kind of know what a crane looks like. And the closest you can get to what a crane looks like, the better off you are, you know, with that. Transforming the wood into a crane, though, has taken plenty of practice. Gene didn't start carving until the age of 74, when he took a class to learn how to do it. Since then, he spent several hours, most days, whittling his time away. What else have I got to do today, you know? Don't have much of an agenda when you're 95. <laughs> That agenda has been a full one, though, for the past 20 years. He started carving ducks, and along the way, has made his share of Swedish Dala horses, and even large replicas of Noah's Ark for his grandchildren. But his attention always turns back to the cranes. They're pretty special, you know? They're a crazy looking bird, but, uh, you know, they, they have their place too, you know, they sure do. Evidently, I'm interested in them or I wouldn't keep messing around with it, I guess, you know. <laughs> There's a structure and an order to Gene's messing around. He goes through 27 different steps before one crane is complete. Gene uses catalpa wood from trees his grandfather planted. He's currently carving from his fourth tree. He twists and turns that wood on his saw until he creates a familiar shape. That will be the beginning of a crane. Then he uses his knife to sharpen the finer points, and a homemade sander smooths the bird's rough spots. 
Pieces of coat hangers will serve as the legs, and he even adds kneecaps. Just don't ask him how he does that. It's really a, kind of a uh, secret, you know. Then he moves to another room in his basement, where he mounts the crane to a base built in the shape of Nebraska. Here's our crane. All that's left to do is add some finishing touches with his paintbrush, and the crane is complete. It's a process he estimates he's done about 500 times. Some of Gene's cranes end up here at the Crane Trust Nature Center. It's the same place where he used to lead crane watching tours. Gene is still showing visitors the beauty of the cranes. Here, I've got an outlet for them. If they, you know, if I want to keep going, I've got an outlet. Just like those cranes on the river, Gene plans to keep coming back to this hobby he's grown to love. And after 95 years, he's learned a simple lesson he's happy to share. You never know for sure what, what's laying back there that, that you would enjoy and that, that you might even be halfway good at, you know. Just go for it, you know. Don't, don't just sit around. Go for it. Gene Gustafson is proof you're never too old to carve out your own niche in life. Watch more Nebraska Stories on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. Nebraska Stories is funded in part by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation.